I can do that. <laughs> nice. <laughs> it's definitely re it's definitely recording. All right, mm -hmm. perfect. It's official. <laughs> okay, so hello everyone. Welcome to our adolescent and young adult cancer program noontime gathering. My name is Matt. I'm the program manager for the adolescent and young adult cancer program. We're really excited to have you all joining us today for this informational webinar. And uh, please let your friends and colleagues know that if they're not able to join us today, a recording of this session will be posted to our Mass General AYA website. So now I'm going to be passing it off to Dr. Anna Abrams, who's the director of the program, and she'll be introducing our specialist for today's talk. Uh, thank you, Matt. Um, and thank you all for joining us for our um, AYA um, medical marijuana um, discussion and talk today. Um, we are incredibly fortunate to be joined by Dr. Ryan Zacklin and Megan Clements, who are from the ECS Wellness Program and have partnered with our Adolescent Young Adult Cancer Program over the past year in providing exceptional care for our patients. Um, and so I wanted to just tell all of you a little bit about Dr. Z and Meg before they uh, take over and spend this hour um, sharing their expertise and wisdom with us. Um, Dr. Ryan Zacklin, better known as Dr. Z, uh, grew up outside New York City. During his youth, he visited all of the national parks in the US, which connected him to the awe of nature. He also developed a love for the arts and music he suffered a repetitive stress injury and was frustrated by conventional medicine's limited offerings for his condition. He turned to other tools, natural foods, yoga, and supplements. This pointed him to mind-body medicine, including meditation and mindfulness. During his internal medicine residency program here at Massachusetts General Hospital, Herbert Benson indoctrinated him into the world of mind-body medicine. Dr. Z is a board certified in, in internal medicine and is also trained in mind-body medicine, herbal medicine, cannabis therapeutics, energy medicine, nutrition, yoga, meditation, and physical rehab. Wow. And when Dr. Z first learned cannabis was medicine, he thought, yeah, right. But he has <laughs> since changed his mind. We're also joined by Megan Clements, who is the nurse practitioner um, in the ECS Wellness Center. And Meg grew up in Maine and developed a lifelong fascination with science and nature particularly how we can use it to heal. She studied biochemistry at Merrimack College and her passion for science and healing led her to becoming a nurse practitioner. As a nurse practitioner, she has been able to incorporate a nurturing and holistic approach to nursing while also using a diagnostic science-driven approach to providing care. Meg's passion and drive to use science and nature to connect with and heal others sits well at ECS Wellness. So. Um, I could not be happier to um, welcome you to this educational series and to learn from you in this upcoming hour. Um, after the presentation, we'll have time for discussion and questions. Please put any questions that you have in the Q&A feature. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Z and Meg. Thank you so much, Dr. Abrams. Thank you, Matt. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna share, oh, I need to screen sharing capability. That. Oh, good. I wonder how much, how many times that happens in like Zoom presentations, <laughs> like it, like since the Zoom, the, the, the sh they should just change the sharing feature. All right. So um, thank you everybody for, for coming to listen. Um, we are ECS Wellness. Um, we're located up in Salem, across from Salem Hospital. We are an MGB community affiliate, and we are proudly one of the MGH Cancer Center support services. Um, and, and, and we are proud to be colleagues of the AYA and, and several of the, the, of the departments that we work with quite closely and quite well. Um, so that being said, let's talk about the endocannabinoid system or the ECS. So the ECS is the system that the body uses to maintain homeostasis or balance. It works this way via, well, so we make these endocannabinoids. We make them. The one on the right is called anandamide, named after the Sanskrit word for bliss. And the other one is called 2-AG. So the first component of the endocannabinoid system are the endocannabinoids that we make. 
Now, there are also these endocannabinoid receptors and the cannabinoid receptors specifically. Why I'm showing this, it's a lot of science, but I think it's worthwhile to understand. So this is a synapse. This is one nerve cell coming down and there's a space between them called the synapse. And then there's a postsynaptic neuron. So the pre and the post. If you've, if you, you, serotonin, for instance, is stored in vesicles here. If you take a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, then it prevents the uptake of the serotonin and more is available in the synapse to be picked up by these receptors. This is way more science than you bargained for. Um, but the important note is that the cannabinoid receptors actually sit on the presynaptic neuron. And it basically is a monitoring mechanism or a fail-safe mechanism. So if there's too much excitation or too much exciting activity here, we'll make endocannabinoids and we'll tone it down. If it's too sluggish, we'll make endocannabinoids and we'll speed it up. I'm a musician, so I like to think of it as controlling our tempo. The distribution of the, of the cannabinoid receptors is throughout the body. There are multiple receptors involved with the ECS, but we really focus on these two, cannabinoid 1 and cannabinoid 2. You'll notice that there are none in the brainstem, very little to none. So this is why with cannabis, why it's not one reason why it's not toxic to us, or why you can't overdose on it, rather. The brainstem has our respiratory drive um, and circulatory drive. And so if you opioids, for example, will slow that down and result in death. Cannabis doesn't do that it, large in part for that reason. You'll also note that all there are many different systems that have CB1 and CB2 receptors. Um, the immune system here is definitely one that's worth pointing out. Also, the GI tract also has CB2 receptors. So the endocannabinoid system, to keep it simple, and it was initially thought to regulate sleep, memory, mood, appetite, pain. And this really covers everything that most of you that are listening to this talk are interested in. It's because it helps regulate the nervous system, though. It really does touch upon and, and part participates in a role that anything the nervous system participates in, which is everything. But I like to keep it this simple. So sleep, memory, mood, appetite, pain. That being said, if we look at appetite, right? So food intake is a part of our circadian rhythms. We're hungry at certain times of the day, okay? The, this ECS is also responsible for thermal regulation, our temperature, no susception, knowing where we are in space. It's a very important piece of our physiology, and it's a very, very important way that we interact with the outside world in relation to our internal world. In fact, the runner's high, which many people think are due to endorphins, our natural painkillers that we produce, it's actually thought to be due to, or there's more evidence that supports it being due to endocannabinoids or AEA as anandamide, the bliss molecule. Well, let's look at that a little bit further. When you're running, you're in an excitatory state. You need something to tone things down a bit. So your body produces the bliss molecule. When you stop, you still got the bliss molecule around, so you feel a little bit blissful. And so this is the runner's high. It's also, it involves a couple of other components, but I think it's important and it's something that you can use to show off at um, cocktail parties or whatnot, that you can ask people what the runner's high is due to and you can correct them and feel good about being right. Um, so what happens with the ECS when it's out of balance? We need to ameliorate it. We need to fix it. We need to optimize it. And that leads to resiliency. And this is really kind of the fundamental of our practice in ECS wellness. We're really, we're going to talk about medical marijuana and the program, but we're really talking about cannabinoids. So we have our cannabinoids that we make, the endocannabinoids, are just simply not enough for this world. I like the phrase, we have a physiology that is designed for a world that just no longer exists. We live in boxes, we travel in boxes, we have, uh, you know, we, we live in a synthetic world, we are somewhat disconnected from nature, and we are unfortunately, while we are electronically connected, we do have a, a bit of a paucity in connection as individuals, and so therefore, we're not making enough endos, so we need to supplement, we need to either participate in activities that increase our production of endocannabinoids, take synthetic cannabinoids or medications, or supplement with phytocannabinoids. Phyto means plant, so cannabinoids that are made from plants. 
So the endocannabinoids, we can participate in activities, as I mentioned, that increase our own production. We already mentioned exercise, and I mentioned connection. So connection actually is, um, it, it, when, when we connect with people, we have either through touch or just simply an emotional connection, we release oxytocin, right? It's the love molecule. And oxytocin regulation and production is largely driven by the ECS. So part of our practice and part of our framework is that when our patients come to us, we have, we're aware and, and we're conscious that the connection we establish with them and our staff does and our office does really does contribute to their healing process or them feeling balanced. Integrative medicine really holds, and this is the specialty of the practice, integrative, integrating mind, body, or spirit, integrating natural or um, with the more conventional um, or the unnatural and the supernatural, um, which fits in with the natural. And so integrative medicine, um, we, we practice integrative medicine in the practice and things like meditation, mindfulness, yoga. We don't have acupuncture, but we will refer out. We don't have massage, we'll refer out and osteopathy, but these also help increase our endocannabinoid production and our endocannabinoid tone. Mind-body medicine is a specialty of mine. So I teach meditation and, uh, and mindfulness, and this allows us to function better and it allows us to process and engage with our world around us in a more balanced way. And that is largely via the endocannabinoid system. This includes meditation and yoga. Um, integrative medicine also includes medications. It's integrative and certain medications do help ameliorate or interact at least with the ECS. Essential fatty acids will help increase production of endocannabinoids. Probiotics, which are found in the gut, will increase the expression of those CB2 receptors I noted. And certain supplements will also help and herbs, particularly one herb. Lifestyle also has an effect. The amount of sleep that we get, what we're eating, what our weight is, exercise, mindfulness, right? All of these things. So to me, in a way, the ECS explains in part why these are so beneficial. It explains how it alters our actual physiology and it allows us to harness it and optimize it. So synthetic uh, medications, if anybody I, I'll, if anybody gets this joke or doesn't get it, this is synthetic grass. So um, I don't really touch upon this and, and they're not really readily available. There are a couple of medications that are cannabinoids and most of them though, of, of the other cannabinoids, they're really experimental and down the pike we may have some, but right now that's not a part of my practice, not a part of Meg's practice or ECS wellness's practice. So phytocannabinoids, now we get to medical cannabis. Now we get to cannabis. So all so cannabis produces all of the phytocannabinoids um, and it also produces terpenes that give it the characteristic smell and flavor. Um, there's really, that's pretty much it for the phytocannabinoids. I mean, technically there are, there's a cannabinoids found in other herbs. I'm not, that's beyond the scope of this talk, but let's get into cannabis therapeutics. So phytocannabinoids, this is the essence of it. We're supplementing with phytocannabinoids. Most of you are going to be familiar with THC. It is one of the handful of phytocannabinoids that will lead to an, that has an intoxicating side effect that many people do enjoy, but many of our patients do or want to avoid it, which is what we help them do. Um, you may also be familiar with CBD. CBD is another phytocannabinoid. It is absolutely 100% psychoactive. That's how it treats anxiety and helps with sleep, but it's not intoxicating. So you, no matter what, how, how, no matter how hard you try, CBD won't get you high. Now, both CBD and THC, they are they, the, the, the precursor molecule actually is THCA or tetrahydrocannabinolic acid, or CBDA, cannabidiolic acid. And so these acid forms, can are they, they exist in the plant. All of the, ter all of the terpenes and the phytocannabinoids are in this acidic form. These acidic forms are not impairing, and they're minimally psychoactive, but they're not impairing. So THCA and CBDA can be used, they can be a little bit more effective for pain and inflammation, and you get a little bit more bang for your buck, but it's co more complicated than that. A lot of this has to do with dose 
And we unfortunately, we don't really know the individual dose and we'll, till, until we kind of set a course of a treatment course. CBG is um, cannabigerol. I, I'm introducing those because you'll probably start, you'll see these if you haven't already. Cannabigerol is actually the precursor, the pre-molecule to THCA and CBDA. It gets differentiated into the two of them. You'll find that CBG is used in a fair amount of products. So these are examples of products th that we might use. Now in, in ECS Wellness, we might just start with a little THC at night. We often will start and go slow. Most of our patients or many of them are what we call cannabis naive. They've either ne they, they've either never used it or they used it back in the day. And most of the people that used it back in the day, um, they, they had a bad experience. So I have to tell them that now this is the day that you're going to go back to. So we'll have to reverse all of that. Now, there are other phytocannabinoids that are not as well known and well studied. The CBN you'll see a lot in some of these sleep products. It's a breakdown product of THC and CBD. A lot of these are synthesized, though, in the, in the lab. They're not actually used from the plant because they're found in such little doses but you may see these coming down the pike. I think there's one product that has THCV, tetrahydrocannabinol varin, which is a which is a variant on THC. It's thought to be good for blood sugar regulation and weight loss. So you might start to see that as well. We're just starting to see that. And, um, so terpenes I mentioned, terpenes are some of my favorite um, molecules just because I, I mean, I love plants and, and I obviously love, we all love the, the, the beautiful, um, the, the colors and but we love the smell and the and the taste and so terpenes are found for example a terpene such as myrcene so so in in cannabis folklore right you you would uh, hear that if you eat mangoes it will enhance the high why that is and it's not necessarily true but mangoes contain myrcene myrcene is found in many of the cannabis plants particularly indica chemo bars, which I'll go into in a moment, and many of you may be familiar with. All right, so that's why it was thought that myrcene will help enhance the high, but let's look at a couple of the other ones. So here's lavender. Lavender contains linalool. Linalool is good for anxiety. You know, we make lavender bath salts and little sachets, right? It's very, it's used for relaxation. So certain strains or chemo bars will have linalool in it, and that has a similar effect right? Uh, an anxiety, anxiolytic, right? It will help with anxiety. Um, this lastly, this is hops, right? If you've ever smelt uh, an IPA, smells a little bit like cannabis. That's the hops. So you have, they're really chemovars rather than strains, but the, the colloquial term is, uh, is strains. And so the strains are really, they go by the indication of sativa and indica. And it didn't include, hy include hybrid here, what I want you to notice here is these look like two completely different plants. And you can see here those purple, that those are flavonoids, but this one probably has some of the linalool in it as well. Um, and so what the difference is basically these, the, the plants contain a balance of phytocannabinoids and terpenes. And, the, and what terpenes they have will essentially result in a certain effect that is desired or undesired. And this is an effect that we kind of tailor and use. So sativa plants, are, they're, they more, they're more energizing and cause what we would call the intoxication is a high. And that's something that we would use during the daytime. Daytime use is, um, it's limited and, and it's very specifically targeted. Obviously we minimize the intoxication, but sativa is something that people, a lot of people use it. They could use it for ADHD. Um, and, and it's just kind of something that, it, like I said, it's it, the best description is energizing. Where indica, we say sativa is sun for S, indica is in the couch. So indica is more sedating. It's more causes couch lock. The intoxication is more stone. It's more sleep inducing, right? So very simple bare bones would be sativas during the day. Indica is for nighttime use. But you'll see if you go on the websites, you'll see multiple strains and they're all different funky names. 
Um, right now, Harbor House Collective has Unicorn Poop and Skywalker OG, which, truth be told, they're two of my favorites. Kosher Kush is good, too, right? So there are all these strange different names, but the names, um, they imply certain genetics and certain lineages. And for cannabis um, lovers and aficionados, um, they and we tend to... Uh, there's there's an experience of the different strains. They almost have their own frequency, but it's a really unique kind of neat property that cannabis has, and it's unlike anything else out there. Um, like it it would be analogous to if it, uh, you know if anybody drinks red wine, not the ones that are younger than twenty one here, but right. So wine has different grapes. It's almost like if those different grapes gave you a different experience. Um, so cannabis therapeutics, what is cannabis therapeutics about then? How do we use cannabis to manage our, our medical conditions? And so there, we look at, we split it into both recreational or adult use. I like recreational and medical as the two distinctions. So let's look at recreational and why I like calling it that. Well, recreational or recreational involves and centers around intoxication, the intoxicating experience is thought to be, it's the desired effect and you're having an experience and use cannabis and it shifts you out of the experience and recreates the experience in, a, in sometimes in a more slow down, deliberate and therefore almost brighter, more aware pace. It's just sometimes it's just that shift, a social experience, a musical experience, whatever it might be. And that's why people use it. A lot of people love it. On the other side is medical use of marijuana. This is symptom management, period. So we're managing anxiety. Perfect. How's the anxiety doing? We're checking your GAD7 and monitoring that. And anything else is a side effect. So if we're trying to manage your anxiety and you're getting high off of the dose, you're feeling high off of the dose that you're taking, well, that intoxication is now a side effect. Well, what if I like that side effect, Dr. Z? All the more power to you, as long as you're using it safely, judiciously, with our professional guidance. Well, then it becomes therapeutic. And I think if you kind of sit in this area, people, there are people that sit in this area and really like to, they don't want to feel any intoxicating experience. And then for the most part, truth be told, I actually think that recreational is therapeutic and has a lot of therapeutic value. So I kind of don't really think of it in this way, but I think this is a really good distinction and it lays it out for you quite clearly, um, just con conceptually. So let's get into edibles. Um, well, let's get into the different delivery forms, right? So edibles, there are a gazillion types of edibles out there. We really focus on tinctures, capsules, um, and gummies. I, I don't really see the need to shape the gummy into a little something that is appealing to children, right? I don't, I'm not a big fan of making candy. I'm also not a big fan of the caloric intake. And honestly, sometimes at night, the last thing I want to do after I brush my teeth and I com completely forgot to take my little gummy is eat a piece of candy, right? So, so for us, we tend to start with tinctures. We, uh, we, if we can find capsules, and then depending, we might convert to a gummy or some kind of mint or a candy that's more easily digested. This stuff, I mean, I don't know. For me, I like to keep my, my you know, my peanut butter and chocolate separate. If I want to have a cup of coffee, I don't have to have THC in it. So that, that doesn't, it's kind of fun, but I, for some people, for me, it's whatever. It's, um, it's not, it doesn't really have a place in medical cannabis. So like I said, tinctures, capsules, and then gummies. So these are little dose cubes. They're tiny little bitter cubes that are five milligrams. So that's something that we may recommend, but there's a reason why we wouldn't. And we'll get into that in a second. Just that particular product, why that would be lower on the list. And this is because it is, they're not made with two of these um, in two of these ways of more or less extracting cannabis oil. So when it comes to edibles, this right here, if you take nothing away from this talk other than how to, how to get the most effective edibles, 
So the most effective edibles are made with something called live rosin or hash rosin. I'll talk about that in a moment, but it's solventless. With the concentrates, when you concentrate cannabis oil, often they'll use a solvent. They will dissolve the oil and they'll dissolve the plant in the solvent. It will extract the oil, they'll remove the solvent, and you're left with an extraction of concentrated cannabis oil. So certain ways of extracting this, leave it as a full spectrum or live resin, not rosin, live resin or something called Rick Simpson oil, where if in this, um, particularly in this group, it's probably something you've come across. So these are made using um, different extraction methods, but they are the most full spectrum. So they contain the most intact form of the plant for the 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 um the solve the the concentrates that use solvents so that's if you're looking for something you can't there's no rosin or hash rosin or solventless can't not solventless rosin go for full spectrum live resin or rso fact is though is that if you're going for something you probably should come see us to ask uh for us to tell you what to go for but on the other side if you this is really so the solventless um, live rosin is made. I don't have a slide for it, but it's really cool. It's it's so they'll what they'll do is they'll harvest the plant, the fresh plant. And in these dispensaries, I mean, there are rooms with like with 300 plants in them. So it, it the smell is is incredible. It's the fresh. So the buds are flowers, right? So it's actually you're actually ingesting flowers. Um, and so what they'll do is they'll they'll harvest it and then within 15 minutes they flash freeze it in the cryo freezer and then they'll take that frozen plant and put it into a large ice bath where it gets perturbed and what happens is the oils and the the plant matter which is frozen they get mechanically separated and sifted out so it's almost like if you removed all of the fiber structure and chlorophyll and everything that makes it the plant and you're left with the pure oils and terpenes, that's what solventless, it's not using a solvent or live rosin or hash rosin. That's what that is. And this is the way to go. This is, it's hard to find hash rosin um, or live rosin products. These are two that you that you will find. Of note, I just wanna make a note here. So these are bedtime products. The problem I have with these is that you can see they contain melatonin and some of them contain other herbs. I try to steer clear of melatonin. It kind of gives you whacked out dreams and it's a hormone. It's not a good idea to take that regularly. So just as a little side note, we do try to avoid products that do contain melatonin. Often the, 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 the hash based products are not sativa or indica. They're hybrid, like middle of the road. They don't lead one way or another. But they can be good for sleep and for anxiety um, and certainly appetite. So I mentioned tinctures. Tinctures are edibles. Anything you eat is an edible. But what's nice about the tinctures is that there are various formulations. And I think of it as, a, we think of it as a way of optimally titrating the dose, right? So it's a liquid form. Most of the gummies are five milligrams. And they're not really, the cannabinoids are not evenly distributed throughout um, and it's usually kind of a, it's, it's a, it's an estimate, right? So some of them will be 4.3, some will be 5.2. It's kind of all over the map. And often we hear, and, and I haven't, I, after years, I still don't feel like I've completely figured it out. And nor Meg and I, it's like, I don't understand people like they'll take like, you know, they'll take a gummy and then they feel it super strong. And then they'll take one the next day and they took another, they felt nothing, absolutely nothing. I, I, it's really hard to, to get a beat on that, but part of it is due to inconsistency in the products. At least that's what I believe. So tinctures are a way that you can mix it up and evenly distribute it. And, and it's a dropper. So a full dropper, let's say of these dream drops here is five milligrams of THC. So you have a liquid gummy. So you can start with one, literally one drop, like 0.17 milligrams and slowly ratchet your way up. And this is often how we'll start uh, start out patients. Actually, if you wanna, we often will use this product, Dream Drops. Um, and then there are topicals. Topicals are not absorbed. So they don't, they don't absorb it into the bloodstream. Um, you know, there are different ones. So there are CBD or CBDA based topicals. There are even one-to-one -one THC and CBD topicals. 
And believe it or not, they even make suppositories. Suppositories are a little bit, um, they're kind of, they're not controversial, but it's, it's, it's uh, my understanding and how I was taught and what makes sense to me is that the suppositories do not, you do not absorb the cannabis systemically. Most people don't get high when they use a suppository. If you're absorbing THC into your bloodstream, you're going to feel high. So I think suppositories are more for localized effects. And I have used them in some patients that have colitis. I actually used it in one patient who, who had an ostomy and was having issues with spasm in the ostomy. I'm not sure they really panned out. I thought it was a good idea though. Um, and then, so combustion, most people are familiar with combustion, i.e. smoking. Um, there are various ways to do it. Joints, bongs, bowls, bubblers, hookahs, right? And so, it, you know, combustion gets interesting, right? So the smoke, is it bad? Does it have a risk of cancer? So the cannabis smoke does have what we call polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and they are carcinogens that are found in cigarette smoke. So, but cannabis has not been found to have an association with head, neck, or lung cancer. In fact, a pulmonologist, Ronald Tushkin, set out to prove that it did, and he was proved wrong and became kind of a convert, if you will, and became a proponent for cannabis. What's even more interesting, and this is kind of hot off the press, there was recently an article in the journal Chest in which they looked at, there were about 33,000 patients hospitalized with COVID-19. 2,600 of them were cannabis smokers. And this is not a license to smoke, and this is not by any means, this doesn't tell, I'm not telling you to, disclaimer, disclaimer. But what they found was that the patients that were marijuana smokers had less intubation, less intubation time, less multi-organ system failure, less hospitalization time, less mortality. Let that sink in for a moment. And this is chess. This is a prominent pulmonology, uh, 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 pulmonology uh, uh, journal that's published. The thought is that because cannabis affects the immune cells, the immune cells have CB2 receptors on it. The thought is that the cannabis minimized the what we call cytokine storm. So the immune cell just gets tweaked and it's like, ah! and it's so it minimized that release of these molecules that cause this disarray. And that's due to the cannabis modulating the immune system within the lungs. That is mind blowing. And that's, that's like, to me, um, you know, in my mind, I'm like, is that a little inkling, a little crack of light of how we were thinking about this is not how it is. But anyway, again, that's not a license to smoke. Um, but it's just to kind of give you an example that there's much more to this than, than we know. So we can also vaporize the oils off of the plant. You can put flour and ground it up and put it into these vaporizers. There are little convection. This one is called the volcano, but these are little tiny convection ovens that will basically distribute the heat and vaporize the oils off of the plant. You're left over with kind of a, a crisp um, browned, uh, ground up plant that actually you can eat and has some beneficial properties to it, but that's kind of what it looks like. It, it smells and tastes a little bit like popcorn. Okay, so you're not combusting or burning the plant matter. You're not producing those, those carcinogens. And I don't want you to, to go back and think, wow, cannabis has carcinogens. I mean, it does, but cannabis smoke has carcinogens. It's, it's, it, it, it has carcinogens and, and other things might have it, but it doesn't mean that it will cause malignancy. So you can also concentrate, you can vaporize concentrates. This was a little bit controversial with the pens on the streets. They were putting vitamin E acetate. It was causing popcorn lung and certain issues. There are other additives that has kind of fallen by the wayside. And that was on the black market only. The, the once live rosin came out, I became a reconvert for the pens, the cartridges. Why? They're, they're very, um, they're discreet, but that's not as much a concern you can instantaneously take a sip off of it. And what it is, is there's a little element here. It heats up the cannabis oil and it vaporizes it. So you can take little sips and you could take sips throughout the day. I, I, I like the, the convenience of it for that, for that thing. And also for some patients that have symptoms of nausea or pain, they need that instant relief and it's very helpful. So for that, we might recommend 
um, cartridges that contain live rosin. These are also, they make pods that contain it as well. And then they have these devices. So these are dad, so these are um, these are electronic dab rigs, and this is a dab rig. So what this is is you take a blowtorch. It's literally free base in cannabis oil. You take a blowtorch, you heat up this nail, it's called, and then you take the cannabis oil and you put it in the hot nail. It vaporizes it, goes through the water and up through the bong, and you're vaporizing cannabis oil. Very highly concentrated. Um, from an intoxication standpoint, there's no other way to describe it than this will knock you on your ass. So this though, that now these are electronic dab rigs and you can see you can control the temperature. These are pretty cool. And, and this is a device. I don't, I have this particular device, but I like these devices and they keep coming out with better and better ones. And uh, as they've become less persnickety, I've started to recommend these to some patients. They have a real good place and a real good, real good use depending. So the concentrates, and we are gonna we're finishing up soon, and we're gonna open up for questions. So the concentrates are basically they're they've been extracted in different ways, and a lot of them are based off of the consistency, right? So it's like batter, sugar, shatter, um, sauce. Uh, I there's a few other ones. This is actual hash. And so, you know, to me, I was not as interested in the um, in the concentrates. Just for several reasons, um, they just made me feel uncomfortable. The solvent made me feel uncomfortable. And again, I don't like to be knocked on my ass. So, uh, but once they came out, once live rosin came to the scene, it kind of changed things for me. And I do use live rosin because you're vaporizing the pure oil and terpenes. It, it's it's really, it, it's, it tastes great and it's filling. So it's right. So this is something, and this is, this is like a high level thing, like something like this, I would recommend to a patient that is a comfortable cannabis user that wants to cut down on their smoking, wants inhaled therapy, and, you know, is really used to it. And, and, and you kind of want to be more of a cannabis lover to appreciate it, but they do make these live rosin carts, as I've noticed, of note, you can sometimes get disposables, which is a nice way sometimes we'll introduce it to our patients. This is nice, uh, it's nice branding, nice packaging, hash wizards. I don't know what that is. So that being said, let's open it up for questions and uh, take it from there. Thank you so much. That was an incredible talk and um, a, a real tour de force of like going through um, all of the things that uh, one can think about with medical marijuana and cannabis use. Um, and I, I actually have a question before we turn it over to some of the questions that are posed. Um, and I'm curious, um, I think this is the first time that I've heard more about the differentiation of various edibles. Um, and I don't think that I've asked my patients um, about the differences in the edibles they use and was really helpful to hear you talk about starting out with tinctures um, as opposed to the gummies. I think that I often just thought edibles and gummies. Um, could you talk a little bit more about how how tinctures are used and um, and just a little bit more about that to explain it both to the providers on this webinar as well as uh, the patients? Yes, of course. Um, so it's more... This this points to more cannabis therapeutics and cannabis therapeutics to me as an artist, especially is more of an art than anything. Who's sitting in front of you? What's their relationship with cannabis, with intoxicants, with the medical system, with Medicaid? I mean, the whole, right, we're a holistic practice. So then once we have that information, then we make a decision of where the starting point is. So if it's my 85 year old lady who has anxiety and, and, you know, I, I don't want, I really don't want her to experience any intoxication because it's going to turn her off or give her uh, even worse, make her lose her balance and whatnot. Then we might just choose a small amount, a judicious amount of CBD. And, and that one, you might start at a little bit of a higher dose and you might start out at something. So there's an interesting study that came out recently that showed um, 10 milligrams of CBD three times a daily of a full spectrum hemp product. Um, significantly reduced anxiety. So we'll kind of follow that a little bit. Three times a day is like, I don't know who can take a medicine three times a day, um, but twice a day. And so we'll start out and we might start with, let's say just five drops 
depending on the product, around five milligrams or so. And then depending on the individual, we might tell them every few days you go up one drop and then see how you feel, right? Give it a few days. If, you, if you're still not getting the relief that you want or feeling where you, the way you want to feel, um, then go up another drop. So that CBD often will start patients or will start them out with a nighttime tincture like those dream drops. And the way that we'll use that, if we're not doing drop by drop, just break it down in quarters. So it's like 1.25 milligrams of THC, two and a half, right? Then 3.75 and five. And what that allows you to do is we now know where the intoxication line is. And that's what we're going for with the tinctures. Some people really love them. Some of them are a little bit off-putting in the flavor, but that's the that's the basic way that we'll do it. Now, there are other products. So the Dream Drops, TreeWorks has a, a, a nice line of products. So they also make something called Jungle Drops that have more cannabinoids and a little more dilute. Sometimes we'll add Jungle Drops during the day at a much lower dose, sub-intoxicating, and we'll add the Dream Drops at night. So it's just kind of, that gives you kind of, hopefully that's enough of a flavor for it. And then we we might, so one issue um, is that the hash rosin tinctures have not yet emerged. They're coming at some point. And so therefore we will try to sometimes convert somebody to a live rosin or hash rosin gummy because it's just a little bit more effective. Um, but at a certain point, it's more of ease of use. Um, that's very helpful uh, to think about and the ease of use. I think another question that has come up um, is in our adolescent young adult patient population, and I know that the laws in Massachusetts in terms of who you can see is 18 and over, are there specific ways that you think about the use of medical marijuana in our um, adolescent young adult patient population and those patients that you see who are going through cancer treatment um, and any kinds of, you know, um, guidance that you would provide or things that you take into account when someone's going through chemotherapy treatment at, in this younger age. Meg, did you want to, do you want to, do you want to answer this? Uh, no, go ahead. You can. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, so um, yeah, I mean, I, I think for us, the obviously at a younger age, we're thinking about brain development, right? It's, We've learned now that you can teach old dogs new tricks and neuroplasticity, right, is 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 lifelong. And so we want to be aware of that. Also, how to develop like appropriate coping skills. However, that being said, if you're undergoing cancer treatment, now you have a much higher need for certain coping tools as well as your skills. Um, so I, you know, again, it's always start low and go slow. I think also it's meeting them where they are. So if they're already a user. You know, not not um, uh, giving them, not kind of uh, giving them a, a nocebo or, or not like hexing their use. Oh, you're using too much. It's, you know, we'll explore kind of, well, why are you using it? What does it do for you? And we really explore in depth what they're, what they're doing. And so I think, you know, by and large, a lot of this population is familiar with cannabis. So, so for, so we are too. So it's a nice place to kind of, to kind of meet them. And I think that that's really, it's just, they also have their own set of issues, right? In where they're at in their life. So, you know, they're at, a, a lot of them are, are at a crossroads, just in general, just career-wise, life-wise, personally-wise. And so I think in terms of the ECS wellness and and we in, in meeting them where they're at, obviously that's, you know, it might not be completely conscious in how we're taking consideration of it, but we might be, um, I might be a little bit more, um, it just might change the way that I'm, that I'm, that I'm doing things like my 85 year old with anxiety, not that I won't, but we're not going to get to meditation right away with a younger patient. We might chill them out with cannabis and then get to meditation more quickly and start working on other lifestyle, uh, um, uh, other lifestyle modalities. Uh, thank you for that. And kind of going off that last question, I was just wondering if you could share any maybe like patient testimonials of, of how medical cannabis has like helped patients in this age group or any stories. Matt, you get you got yeah, you can, I, I'll take this one. I'll take this one. Um, actually, one of my AYA patients who 
she came to us really at the recommendation of her team um, and had always had a bad experience with cannabis. It just was like, no matter you dosing, whatever, she just did not like the feeling, um, but was really looking for symptomatic supports, particularly nausea support as well as sleep. Um, so we, you know, part of my intake was really trying to get her, understand her comfort level um, and get her to trust the medicine. Um, and we started off very, very low. And in fact, ended up working up our, our dosing until she was getting symptom relief, which was a significantly higher dose than she had taken in the past. And now she was feeling, you know, sleep support. She was not having as much nausea. She had appetite stimulation during the day and she was able to eat more of a balanced diet, which was part of what she had always used as her medicine before her cancer diagnosis. And now she could actually go back and eat her plant-based diet and not struggle to get through that, which was huge in her, um, in, in her nourishing herself and being able to take control of her own health as she's going through this difficult time. Um, and now she's on the other side of things and her cannabis has actually shifted, right? So like now she, is in a completely different state. She's not having the daytime nausea. The appetite is no longer an issue. So we really dialed it back and sleep support is still, you know, ongoing, but she really has, has cut back on her use and is still finding benefit from the cannabis at a, at a much lower use based, you know, now that she's in a different state in her, um, in our life. So that's kind of part of it too, is like, where are you at? What's going on in your body where, you know, and just constantly reevaluating. I say to my patients all the time, you know, we're not going to just put you on this and, and you stay on the same dose forever. It's like, okay, what's going on in your body? Where are you at? What do you need? Where's your anxiety levels at? Where's your, you know, how's your sleep? Where's your appetite at? And, and then adjusting dosing accordingly. Uh, just to add to that, I, I think it's important to note that restorative sleep is like at the top of our list always. Right. I mean, it's like if you if you're not sleeping, it, it's it, it, all bets are kind of off. Um, and so I think, by the way, too, I don't know if it's updated. I've always thought I don't think we actually really know why we need sleep, like actually why we need sleep, which is kind of cool if you think about it. But we do. And we find that if by if you if you help restore restorative sleep or you help them get there, well, one, not only have you made a friend for life. But now you really can, um, as Meg is noting, all the other pieces can start to come into play, um, you know, and, and so that's, I think that's a really, that's a really big part of it. Uh, thank you. And another question that's come up for, in terms of just like AYA patients specifically. So are there different, you, you touched on the, the, the different strains and formulas is there how does that kind of go into um like our AYA patients is there are there specific formulas and strains like you talk about in indica in the couch sativa in the sun so nice. I yeah. love it yeah man look at that look at that <laughs> so um yeah I'm just wondering how that how that goes into play with going through cancer treatment Sure. No, I appreciate the question. It's, you know, it's, it's interesting. We get a lot of people think it's more specific than it is, you know, and there are there any strains for, and it's, so the strains specifically, the way that I frame the strains, first of all, the strains are for mostly smoking or vaporizing flour. That's how you have the most access to it. However, some places are starting to come out with live rosin strain specific gummies. And so that makes a difference. Um, but it's almost like a frequency thing. It's like we have our own, you have your own frequency. If you're a high frequency type of person, then most likely if you, that then either a, a higher frequency sativa strain might kind of be more of like consolidating, it might help you focus more. Um, or you might feel like you need to bring yourself down with an indica. Now, uh, that being said, it's not how we would approach our patients if they're not smoking or using any vaporized products they're really not necessarily having access to different strains but they'll have different they'll have access to different cannabinoids sometimes thc is almost impossible to find it's like in three places in the state but if they're if they have access to it we might start them on the thca it's particularly if they have pain or nausea 
um, or CBDA if that's more available. I think that, but ultimately it's the THC that gives you the most bang for your buck and is the most efficient from an effect uh, for, in terms of the most effective and most efficient at lower doses. So I think that's really more how we would approach it. it but it, it's not like if somebody comes to us and they're having nausea as a side effect from their chemo and they're coming and they're cannabis naive and they're coming to us kind of fresh, you know, we we probably would still choose a low dose THC and I might do THC, THC if it was available, but that's not going to be much different than if they come to us with pain. We might go for a CVDA or something. Now, something different. It's important to note though, we have a lot of patients that will try, let's say CBD and they say, I tried, it didn't work for me. I tried the gummies. It didn't work for me. Now, um, if you take a medication, let's say Tylenol, right? 500 milligrams of Tylenol. If you took five milligrams of Tylenol, would you say Tylenol doesn't work? No, it doesn't work for you. No, it's just a tiny, tiny dose. So, for example, CBD cannabidiol is approved is FDA approved as a medication that treats refractory seizure disorders. And so, I have a patient, one patient, and uh, a an, um, a young male patient who has one of these disorders and takes cannabidiol. It's called Epidiolex. All right. So, typically, I mentioned we might get to like ten milligrams three times daily for CBD. He takes five hundred in the morning and seven hundred at night to manage his seizures. So to me, what I tell my patients is, look, it's, it's just, it's, it's like the, the effective dose may just be cost prohibitive at this time. And so that's often we're limited by that. And so to have somebody buy a CBDA tincture that they're going to try and titrate the dose and give it, th give it 30 days and they're not benefiting from it, that can't, that's not going to be as useful as telling them to start with a little bit of a, of a, you know, tincture, indica tincture at night and getting them to sleep. I hope that answers. That, that did answer it. Thank you. Um, I guess we're kind of running up on the end, but I do have one more question that I think could be pretty interesting. Um, given that Given that medical cannabis is certainly like a new area, of research and I'm sure there's a lot of stigma kind of behind it, just the word cannabis and marijuana in general. Um, this one is just more of me being interested, but how do you, me being like nosy, I guess, but how do you navigate maybe an AY patient, you know, they're coming in with their parents and, you know, maybe a parent has like a, you know, kind of still holding on to that stigma, like, no, you're like, I don't want my kids smoking or doing any of this? How do you kind of navigate that? Sure. Um, so I can comment and Meg, if you want to comment too. I mean, I, you know, I think if it's parents, uh, so adult use has made the accept, like has it knocked the stigma down particularly because everybody has, you know, oh, we took, we ate a gummy. Oh, my mom ate a gummy or uh, when you left, right. And you're, you hear the, you hear the stories about eating too much. Um, but I, I think for me, it's one, just being a legitimized doctor helps, right? I mean, especially for older populations. But honestly, if they're having a hard time with it, I have a little quick presentation on the ECS. And I show them it's not really about cannabis. It's about the endocannabinoid system. And sometimes what we'll do also in that case is we'll start out with non-impairing cannabinoids and kind of like earn their earn their trust. We also we also only use the term marijuana in a reference to the Massachusetts Medical Marijuana Program, since that's the title. But the, the word marijuana has um, roots in racism. It was developed. Um, it's a it's Hispanic in origin. Right. And it's kind of was the devil's weed. And so we try to steer away from that and use the scientific term cannabis. And sometimes by simply pointing that out, we just kind of, you know, distinguish our, ourselves and the fact is is that they don't have anything to worry about so it's it can be easy it's easier to reassure them when that is the case yeah I, I mean I also review the ECS with um with most of my patients anyway um sometimes that can be overwhelming but I think also just like it, when we just even say like we're not shooting for intoxication we're gonna work with you and and figure out you know start low and go slow and that whole thing um 
And it's interesting. I, I had like one patient comes to mind whose mother was not um, a fan, but father was. And actually with like having the support of one pa parent had the, the patient felt more comfortable, after, especially after meeting me. And then when she got immediate relief, actually, it was she responded very well at a very, very, very low dose. Um, mom was like thrilled that her daughter was feeling better. So that's what we focused on. And then that became a non-issue. There, there's one comment I want I want to make that I think you'll appreciate that just me coming to mind and it's related, but not completely related. It's more related to all the patients. So in terms of the intoxication, right? So we start low and go slow and our patients might feel a little bit of intoxication. And, you know, we always hear people say, I don't want to feel out of control. And I'm like, I have yet to meet a person who's like, I want to feel out of control. You know I mean? It's like, I get it. Right. And so and they say, you know, I don't want to feel high. And to that, I might say, you know, don't knock it till you've tried it. I would have an open mind towards it. But my line is basically, look, if you end up using your medicine and you feel kind of high and you're a little bit, you know, you're not so sure about it. I'm like, what you should do is just get your favorite music, get your headphones, set up your bed, you know, get have some water, right? Have everything nice. Go to your closet, go to your pants, take out your big boy pants or your big girl pants and put them on and ride it out. <laughs> and so that's kind of our, that's one approach that we have. I mean, I obviously, I don't think Meg takes that same approach, but I have a little bit more playful, right? So it's kind of just another, another way that we do it. And that's just an example of just helping them to lighten up, right? Just helping, we, we get we are thrilled to sit in a position in which we generally help people feel better. And it's a nice privileged seat to be in. So. Um, before we wrap up the hour, I wanted to say thank you to both of you for joining us today. And I also wanted to let any of the Mass General Hospital providers and patients know about our partnership and connection with ECS Wellness. So, so for the providers on the webinar, we can actually through EPIC um, request a referral to Cannabis Therapeutics and that goes directly to Dr. Zacklin and Meg Clements and their program. And for patients in the Mass General Hospital system, um, you can also ask your care providers here at the Cancer Center and they can put in that referral um, as well. And that partnership has actually been incredibly valuable to our AYA cancer patients um, because it also means that Dr. Zacklin and Meg have access to the EPIC record and they can understand and know the cancer therapy that someone's going through, as well as the providers here knowing what they have recommended. So I just wanted to share that because I think that has really been um, a wonderful addition uh, to the services that we can provide. Um, and a wonderful collaborative partnership. Um, so thank, thank you. you all so much for being here today. Um, and we look forward to continuing this wonderful partnership. Thank you, everybody. Likewise, likewise. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Hey, and everybody have a nice Thanksgiving. Take care.